Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so the, our talk is called uh, the Omega Rule and the Categoricity Problem. Thanks for having, having me, by the way. Um, and so this is a follow-up to a paper that we published last year and uh, called Categoricity by Convention. Hopefully that will become clear in a minute. Okay, so yeah, so we've sort of been working on this project of explaining in a naturalist friendly way, how our logical and mathematical expressions determinately come to have their standard meanings. Um, so the meta semantic view that we're using is a moderate form of inferentialism. The basic idea is that use of our language has to fix what the meaning of the terms are. And so on our view, the meanings of our logical and mathematical expressions have to be fixed by our dispositions to use those expressions. And in particular, our dispositions to infer in accordance with the basic rules of inference that govern those, express those expressions. So in particular, to be disposed to infer in accordance with say, uh, conjunction introduction in the way we are is to be disposed to treat that as a valid uh, inference, a valid inference rule. And so the idea is that the validity of the rules, if all goes well, is enough to rule out any sort of deviant interpretations of, of the expressions. So it, as I said, we have this previous paper, Categoricity by Convention. And in that paper, we tried to show that in the case of our logical and mathematical language, all does go well. Um, so we, we did a, a few different things in the paper. We, uh, we first had to answer Carnap's categoricity problem for propositional logic. So in, in his book, Formalization of Logic, Carnap uh, pointed out that there are these deviant interpretations of the propositional connectives that are compatible with the rules of uh, classical propositional logic or, or standard axiomatizations. Uh, so we had to explain why those deviant interpretations are ruled out. And our strategy was to defend a particular conception of validity, which is called the local conception. And on that conception, um, the validity of the standard sequence style natural deduction rules provably does rule out these deviant interpretations and it fixes the standard meanings for the connectives. Um, I'll talk in detail, a little bit of detail about what the local conception is in a bit. Uh, so once we had that, we had to show how to extend that result to the standard rules for the first order quantifiers. And to do that, we adapted a proof from a paper by Bonnet, uh, Denis, Denis Bonnet and Dag Vesterstahl from, uh, from 2016 called uh, Compositional, Compositionality Solves Carnap's Problem. And we took their proof and we noticed that they relied on some kind some uh, semantic assumptions, but if you sort of massage things in the right way, you can just uh, get rid of those assumptions and justify everything just on the basis of sort of claims about how we're disposed to infer. So that's what we did. And then finally, uh, we showed that this result about the first order quantifier straightforwardly generalizes to quantifiers of higher order. Uh, and this allowed us to get the standard full interpretation of second order logic and by doing that, we were able to secure by appeal to sort of well-known categoricity theorems uh, from Dedekind and Zermelo that, uh, that arithmetic is categorical and that set theory is quasi-categorical. So that's, that's kind of how the, uh, how the argument worked in, in the paper. Uh, and, and by doing, by, by giving an account of the categoricity of arithmetic and stuff, we were able to answer certain kinds of uh, meta-semantic challenges that have been put forward by people like Skolem and Putnam, and more recently, Tim Button. So, okay, so, so that was, that's kind of broad strokes what we did in the previous paper. Our results have uh, been called into question, uh, specifically, Konstantin uh, Brinkus uh, has uh, a forthcoming paper where he points out, look, in formalization of logic, Carnap exhibited some deviant interpretations of the quantifiers in addition to his deviant interpretations of the propositional connectives. Uh, we did not consider those interpretations in our paper. Bonnet and Vesterstahl did not consider them in, in their paper either. 
And Brinkus suggests that our, the strategy that we defended in our paper does not give us a way to rule out these kinds of uh, deviant, Carnapian deviant interpretations of, of the quantifiers. Uh, and that means it doesn't give us a way to secure the standard meanings for the quantifiers after all. So, um, so Brinkus goes on to suggest that rather than doing what we, what, what we do, um, we should just insist that uh, one of the basic rules of logic is an infinitary rule, uh, most commonly known as the omega rule. This was a rule introduced by Carnap himself to solve incompleteness stuff and whatever. Uh, so yeah, so, so the, uh, Brinkus is saying, look, your strategy doesn't work. We need to, we need the omega rule to, to secure uh, the categoricity of the quantifiers. Um, and Brinkus suggests that this does work. The, the, the validity of the omega rule does rule out Carnapian deviant interpretations. And other people have recently appealed to versions of uh, the omega rule for similar reasons. Uh, so Garson in his uh, book from 2013, James Garson, uh, what logics mean, he appealed to the omega rule also to secure some kind of uh, some somewhat standard interpretation of the quantifiers. And Jared Warren um, in his recent work has said that you need the omega rule to get the categories, to, to get the determinacy of arithmetic. Uh, but yeah, so, so there's, uh, there's this kind of constellation of people recently who have been sort of defending this idea that we should, we should insist that we can follow this infinitary rule called the omega rule. Um, okay, so uh, the shared idea among these people is that uh, if we want to give an inferentialist friendly account of the determinacy of our logical and mathematical language, we need to accept that infinitary rules like the omega rule have some role to play in governing our use of that language. So Julian and I think this idea is mistaken. Uh, in particular, we think that uh, infinitary rules are not needed here at all. And we also think that from a naturalist perspective, appealing to these rules is not gonna be of any help anyway, because it's very unclear whether we can follow them. So um, we're gonna argue for the first claim today. We, uh, we have things to say about the second claim as well, but really today we're just gonna talk about um, why it is that the, the omega rule is not needed. Okay, so, uh, right, so, so the omega rule, I think probably will be familiar. Uh, it allows you to move from an infinite number of premises, A is phi, B is phi, C is phi, et cetera, uh, to the conclusion for all X, X is phi. And uh, intuitively, this is a valid rule. Right? If you have a denumerably infinite domain and you have names for all the objects and you can just list all the objects and say, yeah, that one has the property phi, that one has the property phi, that one has the property phi, then it should follow intuitively that every object in the domain has the property phi. So, uh, so it's, it's an intuitively valid rule in some sense, uh, but it's, it's not recursive. Uh, and so because it's in infinite and not recursive and stuff, uh, no standard computing device is gonna be able to determine in a finite amount of time whether a putative instance of the rule is genuinely an instance of the rule. We think for reasons like this, it's pretty questionable whether we finite beings are able to follow a rule like this. Uh, yeah. So, um, so the problem, okay, okay, so the thing is, if we can follow the omega rule, uh, there are some significant metasemantic consequences, which have been pointed out by people like Warren and Carson and, and Brinkus and Carnap. Um, so for one thing, uh, closing piano arithmetic under the omega rule gives us true arithmetic, which is the theory containing all truths expressible in arithmetical language. Uh, and this is the reason uh, Warren in particular argues that we can follow the omega rule, because if we do follow it, we can give an inferentialist account of arithmetical determinacy, uh, which is you know, an account of how it is that every sentence of the language of arithmetic is determinately either true or false, because we, we posit, we say that we can follow the omega rule, that gives us true arithmetic, and true arithmetic assigns a, a truth value to, to every sentence of the language of arithmetic. 
So, and then sort of relatedly, Carnap and more recently, Garson and Brinkus have argued that the omega rule is required for the categoricity of the quantifiers. So Carnap pointed out that the consequence relation of first order logic is compatible with radically deviant interpretations of the quantifiers. And similarly, Garson and Brinkus have purported to show that the interpretation of the quantifiers is not genuinely fixed by the validity of standard intro and elimination rules. So um, our claim is that supposing we can follow the omega rule is not necessary to account for either arithmetical determinacy or the categoricity of the quantifiers. And our categoricity story, our categoricity by convention story, which we introduced in our previous paper, that doesn't appeal to any infinitary rule. And we, we wanna claim that it straightforwardly gives us the resources to account for arithmetical determinacy and the categoricity of the quantifiers. So that's what we're arguing for. Okay, so I'll briefly uh, say why the omega rule is not needed for arithmetical determinacy, and then uh, say a little bit more about why it's not needed for the categoricity of the quantifiers either. Okay, so the relevant part of our story is that, um, so according to our account, the validity of the intro and elimination rules for our logical expressions fixes the standard interpretation of those expressions. Uh, to arrive at this result, we appeal to the open-endedness of the intro and elimination rules. That is to the fact that these rules not only are valid in our current language, but we're disposed to continue to treat them as valid regardless of how we expand our language. Uh, we'll return to the details of that in the next section. They're not relevant for our purposes here. Uh, but what is important is that the, re the result that we get to applies not just in the case of the propositional connectives and the first order quantifiers, but in the case of the second order quantifiers as well. Remember I said, we sort of show how to generalize this to quantifiers of higher, higher order. So our account, if it's successful, secures the standard full interpretation of the second order quantifiers. And since full second order logic is available, uh, we can then give a second order axiomatization of piano arithmetic called PA2, and PA2 is essentially just standard piano arithmetic, but you replace the first order induction schema with a second order induction axiom. And, uh, and we know from long ago from Dedekind's categoricity theorem that PA2 fixes up to isomorphism, the standard model of our arithmetical language. That is, it picks out uniquely the natural number structure. So, um, you know, and, and it just kind of immediately follows that every sentence of the language has a determinate truth value, namely whatever truth value is assigned to it by the standard model. So, uh, so insofar as our approach to the categoricity of the quantifiers is successful, we can then use full second order logic and secure arithmetical determinacy sort of immediately uh, without any extra sort of infinitary inferential resources, anything beyond PA2. So I mean, that's you know fairly simple, but um, so I think the more interesting stuff is going to go on here. So uh, so the omega rule we want to claim is not needed for the categoricity of the quantifiers either. Uh, so what we're arguing uh, is well, yeah. So so just remember first for now that Carnap, Garson, and Brinkus all suggest that the omega rule is needed to secure the categoricity of the quantifiers. What we claim is that, again, our categoricity by convention story, which does not appeal to any infinitary rule, is going to suffice. Um, and we, we argue specifically that Carnap, Garson's, and Blinkus's negative results crucially turn on the way to understand the inferentialist slogan that the validity of our rules fixes the interpretation of the expressions. In particular, we argue that if validity is understood according to the conception we favor, which is the local conception, which I'm about to explain, uh, then the validity of the rules for the quantifiers is in fact incompatible with any of the deviant interpretations offered by these philosophers. Okay, so, <clears throat> so to, to explain what's going on here, I need to say a little bit more about the categoricity by convention story. I'm gonna to try to be as fast as possible. Uh, so in the course of providing our account, one of the things we proved was what we called the weakened first order thesis. And basically 
I'm not going to read the, the formalism, but what this says is, um, the, so it says the rules of first order logic are valid with respect to some class evaluations only if all the valuations have the following property. Uh, the, a, universal quantified, a universally quantified sentence is true if, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> if the property phi that is uh, under discussion in the universally quantified sentence uh, is had by every object that is a possible value of a variable. So basically, the weakened first order thesis gives us a restricted interpretation of the quantifiers where we know that uh, the universal quantifier uh, ranges over some subset of the domain, namely the subset that is consists of all the possible uh, values for the variables. So, so what we can prove is that there's this, um, that we get at least a restricted quantifier, a restricted interpretation of the quantifier. And then once we had that, we were able to strengthen the result, giving us the full first order thesis, which basically says, well, it's not just a restricted interpretation. The, inter uh, uh, the range of the, uh, the quantifier has to be the entire domain. So basically you just get the standard interpretation, the, 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 the validity of the rules of first order logic uh, guarantees the standard uh, interpretation. That's what, that's what it says. So uh, we also, we generalize this to second order logic as I, as I mentioned, but we're gonna set that aside because that's not what's relevant here. Okay, so, so, so that's, how, that's how it was supposed to work. Um, however, the deviant interpretations given by Carnap, Garson, and Brinkus appear to be straightforwardly inconsistent with this first order thesis, right? Because they're supposed to be interpretations that are compatible with the rules, but are not the standard interpretation. So what's going on here? Does this mean that our proof has gone wrong? Uh, Brinkus suggests that it does, uh, but I'm going to show that it, it doesn't actually. So. Um, Right, so, so let's think uh, about how, a little bit more about how the account is supposed to work. I hope, I hope that I, I'm gonna say enough here to make it somewhat clear. Uh, but anyway, the, the account requires two things, uh, an appeal to the local conception of validity and an appeal to open-endedness. I've mentioned both of those already. I, I will um, explain further now that open-endedness is required only to get us from the weakened first order thesis to the first order thesis. Essentially what happens is the weakened first order thesis tells us that the quantifiers range over some subset of the domain. And it's gotta be a subset that contains at least all the objects with names. And then the claim that we're making, which is that our logical rules are open-ended is that they remain valid in any expansion of the language. In particular, even in a new language in which objects that didn't have names before are now given names. Um, and this is just because we're disposed to continue to use the rules irrespective of how the language is expanded. So we have a, like an inferentialist story about why our logical rules are open-ended. And uh, so since any object in the domain can in principle be given a name, the quantifiers have to range over all of those objects, which means they have to range over the entire domain. That's a very rough sketch of how we get from the weakened first order thesis to the first order thesis. Uh, but the, the thing is that the worries about the categoricity of the quantifiers that we're trying to address here are not worries about this open-endedness stuff. They're worries that arise earlier. So we're gonna set the open-endedness stuff aside uh, and talk a, a bit more about the local conception of validity. So yeah, this is the, this conception, we use it all over the place. We use it even to get this categoricity of the propositional connectives. Uh, so I want to explain very quickly what the local conception is. Uh, so we start with a formalization of first order logic by means of standard natural deduction calculus and sequence style. So, so that a rule looks something like this. You have some premise sequence and they allow you to conclude a conclusion sequence. Um, and we're gonna suppose that the elements here can be open formulas, not just, not just sentences. Okay, so to evaluate a rule for validity, we need to wait to evaluate sequence. So we're gonna say that a sequence uh, that evaluation V um, satisfies 
sub s a sequent, where s is a variable assignment, uh, if and only if in that valuation, that variable assignment either makes some uh, element on the left false or makes phi uh, the, the element on the, on the right true. So essentially, a sequent is satisfied relative to a variable assignment just in case on that variable assignment, either at least something in gamma is false or uh, phi is true. Uh, and then we can say, we can define satisfaction in terms of this kind of satisfaction relative to a variable assignment by just saying, look, evaluation satisfies a sequent if it satisfies sub s that sequent for every variable assignment s. So basically, evaluation satisfies a sequent if it satisfies it relative to every variable assignment. That's all. So with these definitions, we can just define local validity as preservation of sequence satisfaction. So if a rule has some premise sequence and a conclusion sequence, we say that it's locally valid uh, if uh, for any valuation, if that valuation satisfies all of the premise sequence, that it, then it also satisfies the conclusion sequence. So th this is the local character, uh, characterization of validity. I'm not gonna say a bit uh, too much about why we use it, except that it seems reasonable and it does what we want it to do. Uh, so, uh, okay, so, so now that we have this conception of lo this local conception of validity, uh, let's think of the, the, the for all introduction rule and we're gonna formulate it as follows uh, from, uh, this sequence from gamma to phi, you can conclude the sequence from gamma to for all x phi, as long as x doesn't appear free in gamma. Okay, so that's, that's how, that's a pretty standard formulation of for all introduction, and that's the one we're going to use. So for instance, the rule would direct us if we already accepted uh, this sequence from the empty set to px to accept the sequence from the empty set to all, for all x px, uh, so if the rule is locally valid, it has to be that every valuation that satisfies the empty set to sub px also satisfies the empty set to for all x px. So suppose a, a, a valuation satisfies the, this sequence here. Uh, what does that come to? Uh, it means that uh, in the valuation, every object such that x can be assigned to it, basically every value, every possible value of x is a p. Right, because that's just what it takes for B to satisfy sub S that sequence for every variable assignment S. You have to, it has to be able to satisfy the sequence no matter what object X picks out, more or less. Okay, so, uh, okay, so, so I hope, I hope it's somewhat clear what, uh, what local validity is doing. And now that we have this local validity account, we can use it to just immediately rule out the non standard valuations that uh, have been introduced. So yeah, so there's, there's two kinds. There's a kind that's introduced by Carnap and a kind that's introduced by Garson. Uh, Brinkus discusses both of them. So we're gonna just con consider Carnap's uh, non-standard uh, interpretation and Garson's as well. Okay. So uh, actually I might just skip Garson's because it's less interesting and we're almost out of time. Uh, okay, so uh, let, let's just talk about Carnap. Uh, so Carnap considers the following kind of deviant interpretation of the quantifier. Uh, for all x, p, x is interpreted as every individual is p and b is q. So it's a stronger, it's stronger than the standard interpretation, right? Uh, and he shows, or he, he, he explains that this is, uh, this, this is compatible with the consequence relation of first order logic. And he concludes, that his axiomatization of first order logic or the one he's considering at this moment is not a full formalization of the logic of functions. And like I said, uh, the consequence relation of his axiomatization of first order logic is compatible with the deviant interpretation. This is why he goes on to add the omega rule. Uh, but Brinkus, I mean, goes further because he's, he's responding to us to some degree. And he argues explicitly that this deviant interpretation is compatible with the validity of the rules as we understand this validity, and this is incorrect. So I'm gonna just close with a proof of that. 
Okay, so consider evaluation V plus in which every object is a P, but B is not a Q. According to Carnap's deviant interpretation for all X, PX is false in this valuation because for it to be true, B has to be a Q as well, remember? So, uh, but consider again, the instance of for all introduction that we just talked about. Um, notice that V plus satisfies the premise sequence. As we've already established, all that it takes to satisfy the premise sequence is that in V plus, every possible value of X is a P, but every object is a P. So certainly every, every possible value of X is a P. Um, but then the local validity of for all introduction guarantees that V plus satisfies the conclusion sequence as well. And this means that for all X, PX has to be true in V plus, but that's contrary to what Carnap's deviant interpretation entails his interpretation entails that for all x, px is false in this valuation, as we already said. So the local validity of for all introduction is just not compatible with Carnap's deviant interpretation, despite what someone like Brinkus might suggest. Okay, and I think I am out of time, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into Carson's uh, non-standard valuation, but uh, suffice to say, every, everything works pretty much the same as it does in. Uh, in the in the case of Carnaps. So, okay. Anyway, thank you, thanks. Brad. <laughs>